So our objective here is simply to find the polar moment of inertia, which is IP. In this case, we're going to call it. Now, the IP has to go through a certain point, because regular moments of inertia, if this was a square, you have IX goes through this way, IY goes this way, and IP is really going through the z-axis. We're talking about rotation here. So we're taking this, mo this object and we're trying to find how much it resists rotation. What point is it rotating through? The problem states that we're trying to find it through the centroid, which is somewhere here. We have to find where the centroid is first. And now the formula looks like this. Now you'll notice here I have ones and twos. I'm going to label where my one is. My one is this lower box and my two is this upper box. So A1 is the area of this box, A2 is the area of that box. The Y bars I'm going to measure from a baseline right here. You don't necessarily have to label it, but just so you know what I'm talking about when I'm measuring from a certain distance from another distance. Now it's pretty easy to know here, uh, find the y bar, Y1 bar and Y2 bar, because we're just talking about the distance from the baseline to the centroid of that object. So for example, y1 bar is a distance from the baseline to the centroid of object 1, which is just halfway through since it's a rectangle. So that's only 1 inch. So let me start with the area of 1 is 8 inches times 2 inches. And we just said that y1 bar is 1 inch. Same thing with object 2 here. The centroid is right in the middle of that object. Doesn't mean that we measure from the bottom of that object up. We still use the same baseline. So that's two inches plus halfway up is an additional four inches. That's a total of six inches. So the area of the object two, two inches times eight inches. And then Y2 bar we just said was six inches. And the combined area. Okay. So that happens to be 3.5 inches. Now that's measured from the baseline as well. So if we're trying to find distances between here, we're going to have to reference later through this baseline using this 3.5 inches. All right, now we know where our centroid is. And that's measuring up from the baseline. As far as side to side, we know the centroid is right in the middle just because it's symmetrical. But we'll get there. Now we want to find the moment of inertia. We can use this equation right here. This is the polar moment of a uh, polar moment of inertia equals the moment of inertia in the x direction plus the moment of inertia in the y direction. Okay. I'm also going to want to use the next couple formulas as well, since these centroids are distance from this axis. We're going to have to use the parallel axis theorem. So parallaxis theorem, let me explain what these terms mean. This is what we're looking for. This is the moment of inertia through our desired axis, which is right through here. This is the moment of inertia through its own centroid. It's important to fo focus on its own centroid. So for this box, we're talking about its own centroid. Plus the distance, that's the distance between the axis and that object centroid. So that distance is squared times the area of that object. A common mistake is to add the area of other all of the objects, but this is just talking about per object. We want to use this formula. So Ix of everything, I'm going to use the moment of inertia for my first object plus the distance from my first object, which is from here to here, the area of my first object. I'm going to write the same formula again, but for my second object. Notice that my distances and my areas are different. One thing that you need to memorize is the moment of inertia for a, a rectangle. And that's pretty easy. It's the base, which is always parallel to the axis, and the height cubed, the height being measured perpendicular. So since we're looking at the x-axis here, this is going to be the base and this is going to be the height for object one. That stays the same. Alright, so the base for this first object 
Remember the base is perpendicular to the axis, so that would be h 8 inches. The height is 2 inches. The distance is a little more tricky because we have to remember we have to reference our baseline. Our the distance from here to here, we can take this whole distance and subtract this smaller distance. So our big centroid, which was 3.5 inches, subtracted by baseline to our centroid of object one, which is just one inch. So 3.5 minus one inch is 2.5. Again, I have the area, base times height. Eight inches is the base. Two inches is the height. I'm gonna start another row here. Now notice the base here of object two is just the opposite of object one. Okay, let's try to find this distance. So we said that this was six inches from the baseline to the center of our second object. And our distance from baseline to our axis was 3.5. 6 minus 3.5 is 2.5. Just happens to be the same. That's not always the case. And that's multiplied by our base times height. 2 inches is the base. 8 inches is the height. All right, you plug that into your calculator, and you should get 290.7 inches to the fourth. Now, I always take a step back, and I look at if all of my units agree. So this is inches times inches to the third, that's inches to the fourth. Inches squared times inches times inches, it's also inches to the fourth. Same thing and same thing, my answer is inches to the fourth, which is what I expect for moments of inertia. But that's just Ix. We also need Iy in order to get our polar moment of inertia. Iy is a little bit easier. So this is the axis that we're looking at now. Notice how that went through all three centroids. So we're not going to have this term in here. We're not going to have their d squared a, also known as the transfer term, because it doesn't need to be transferred any distance. So that's just going to be ic1 plus ic2 in the y direction. However, there is a catch to this one, because our bases and heights switched as we went to the y-axis. Let me show you what I mean. So before, we had our base, for object one, our base was eight and our height was two. Now that we're looking at the y-direction, our new base is parallel to that axis, so our new base for object one is two inches. Likewise, our height is eight inches. Object two has also switched, so the base is now eight inches, and the height is now two inches. So you plug that into your calculator, you get 90.67. Now notice these are both intermediate answers and I have four significant digits. And in my final answer I'm only gonna have three and that just increases accuracy. It's standard procedure for engineering. Again, I do my units check, inches times inches to the third, inches times inches to the third, inches to the fourth. That's exactly what I would expect. So now I have to go back to my first formula. In order to get my polar moment of inertia, I simply have to add my x plus my y, and that will get me 381 inches to the fourth. Now I only have three sig figs, like I said. Now let me check something for reasonableness. We talk about reasonableness, and sometimes we don't know what that means. So a good example here is that if we compare the x direction and the y direction, we can already know that the x should be much bigger than the y by looking at the picture. Because in the x direction, we have quite a lot here. Even though it's relatively close, we have a lot of it farther away from this axis. And this is a skinny part, however, we have it's pretty far away from the axis. Now compare that to the y axis, I only have two wings coming off to the side not really very much coming off here on this stem. So I know that this is probably not going to resist rotation as much as this direction. So that's why our Ix is much bigger than our Iy. And this is our final answer. So I'm gonna draw my arrow.
And I'm done.